Thank you all very much. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, the award ceremony portion of the uh, symposium. And I wanted just to say a couple of words um, about how that came about. Uh, we, we had a long process uh, and discussed how we would, um, how we would implement C3E. Uh, one of the um, things that we decided on was to acknowledge mid-career women um, in, in a range of categories. Actually, the agenda of the symposium is organized around the award categories. And um, we did a, uh, a nationwide outreach uh, to get um, uh, uh, nominations. We had a, an online nomination process. We received, I don't know, 150 or 170 nomination for, I can't remember, from across the country. Uh, we had very good geographic distribution, um, which I thought was terrific. Um, and the, uh, we met, uh, the ambassadors, uh, C3E ambassadors met at Endicott House this summer at a retreat. We had a lovely time, and we broke up into groups, and we uh, selected uh, the award winners. And so this is, uh, we view this as an opportunity to help launch the, uh, or further the careers of women at mid-career, not to give awards to a lot of women who've already received a lot of awards. So hopefully this will be career enhancing for the, the uh, women who are receiving the awards here today. And what we are doing is we are, uh, C3E ambassadors are going to be the presenters of the awards. And, um, and the first uh, presenter uh, is uh, Frances Beinecke. Um, Frances is a C3E ambassador. Her bio is in the program, so you can read more about Frances there. I'm sure most of you are already familiar with Frances in the room. Um, uh, she is the president of NRDC. Under Frances's leadership, NRDC has sharply focused its efforts on establishing a clean energy future that curbs climate change, revives the world's oceans, defends endangered wildlife and wild places, and protects our health. Importantly, Frances is a member of the MIT Energy Initiative's External Advisory Board. Um, MITEI pays a lot of attention to uh, uh, what Frances has to say. And so she's going to say a few words and present the award for outstanding work in education and mentorship. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and particularly a pleasure to uh, give this award. This is the award for education and mentorship. And we are giving it to Tracy Holloway, who's an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin, the Nelson Institute for, this is a long name, Environmental Studies, Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, and Civil and Environmental Engineering. And of course, the Nelson Institute is named after Gaylord Nelson, Senator from Wisconsin, who was the founder of Earth Day in 1970. So I think that's a wonderful link of our need to go towards a clean energy future and where the environmental movement started. Tracy has a very rich career as a specialty in air pollution and uh, air transport, both at the local level and globally. And she got her uh, degree at Brown, her PhD at Princeton, and graduate work uh, postdoc at Columbia, and is now uh, in the wonderful Midwest, the center of the country. She, I think, the reason we're giving her this award is that she is a leader in advancing the careers of young people, and particularly women. And I hope that she talks to us about the Earth Science Women's Network that she has helped create globally. There are now 1,600 women around the world from 20 countries who are connected via listserv seminars, uh, job sharing, and not job sharing, but po job posting, and really have developed a relationship with one another to further careers in clean energy and in science. And I think that that is an enormous contribution and exactly what we're here today to foster. She also was a leader in designing the Global Steward Sustainability uh, Prize at the University of Wisconsin, which is creating um, cash prizes for innovative uh, technologies, prizes up to $50,000. It's one of the largest cash prizes for energy innovation in the country. So, Tracy, if you will come up here, I am going to present the award to you if someone hands it to me. Oh, yes, here it is. <laughs> I was just looking for the award to Tracy Holloway for mentorship and education.
Um, well, thank you so, so much, uh, Francis, for that uh, nice introduction. And for the whole C3E idea and team, especially the leadership, the staff, and the amazing uh, ambassadors. So um, I really appreciate this opportunity so much. Uh, so I just wanted to use a few, my few minutes up here to say that I really love my job at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I could talk for a long time about why that is, but the main reason is that as a professor at Uni University of Wisconsin, I can mix the thrill of research with the joy of working with students and helping launch new careers. And I could focus this um, love, love speech on um, my uh, home at the University of Wisconsin, which is a, a research center called SAGE, where we engage undergraduates, graduate students, and postdocs in trying to chart out um, quantitative evaluation of sustainability for energy, agriculture, land use, and other issues. Um, my broader home at the university, the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, uh, and the campus-wide energy initiative that I've been very involved in ever since being hired at Wisconsin specifically to advance research and teaching on energy. But as um, Francis noted, Really, uh, one of my most exciting uh, ways to spend time is working with a group called the Earth Science Women's Network. And since that has a lot in common with the C3E network goals, um, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about the organization and perhaps um, see if there's any lessons that would be transferable to this great group of women and men in energy. So um, ESWN, uh, is the Earth Science Women's Network. We named it ESWN because we thought it sounded kind of like ESPN. <laughs> and so it could flow off the tongue. Um, and we started, though, with no grand plan. Um, there were about five or six of us who were meeting at our annual professional meeting every year. And as we were starting postdocs and finishing graduate school, we realized that it was so nice to have women at a similar stage in our career at other institutions so we could talk about some of these day-to-day -day decisions that actually are shaping where our careers were going. And um, so we said, you know, let's start an email list. And it was very simple. It was six emails. And then we said, oh, you know, I think my friend Joan would really appreciate some of the discussions here on how do you decide whether to take a faculty position or whether to change your name when you get married if you've already started a publication list. And so slowly by surely we added friends and colleagues and then we were at 25 women. And for the next five years we doubled every year to, to, to 50, 100, 200, 400, 800. And, um, uh, then we couldn't keep doubling forever, uh, <laughs> but actually as of today, we're at about um, 1,725 women. Um, so we do have to keep checking the roster because the numbers are going up every day. And um, this list has uh, served some goals that we didn't really even know were there to be served. All along, we thought, well, what would help us? I mean, it helped us just to have some peers to bounce ideas off of and it would help us to have some jobs that we could share with each other. And actually the job sharing became so frequent and so intense that we thought it was not fair to keep this just for the women. So we spun off a separate Earth Science Jobs Network that now posts between five and 10 jobs a day, uh, including in energy, but all across fields in geology and environmental sciences. And that's open, totally free for anybody to join or post. Um, but, uh, but over the years then, you know, we've, we've set up the, the network to let individuals get out of the organization what they need and want at a particular time. And that may be advice, and it may be community. Uh, and so on the topic of community, there are uh, organizations that are springing up around the world uh, having get-togethers through ESWN that just emerge organically. And, um, actually, this weekend, if you're in Honolulu, there's an ESWN get-together. <laughs> and um, <laughs> there's one every, every month in Bergen, Norway. Um, so uh, there's a lot of um, in-person activities that can be accomplished. But there's also this 
um, kind of truth that's emerged that sometimes you think that something is just your personal issue. And when you start sharing it with a group, especially such a large group, um, you realize that, wait, other people are finding the exact same issue and maybe there are structural ways to address this. And um, there's been a lot of big changes that have happened through the American Geophysical Union, through NSF, uh, through professional societies that have come out from people just you know, asking questions and posing ideas in this context. So I think there's a lot of power in the network and it would be great to see um, C3E uh, play that role for women across career stages and across the world in energy. So thank you very much, very much. Thank you, Francis, and congratulations, Tracy. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Marilyn Brown. I've known Marilyn for many years. Uh, she's a C3E ambassador, and she's a professor in the School of Public Policy at Georgia Institute of Technology, where she created the Climate and Energy Policy Laboratory. In 2010, President Obama nominated her to the board of the Tennessee Valley Authority, and Marilyn will say a few words and present the Award for Excellence in Energy Technology Development. Well, I'm very thrilled to introduce you all to Professor Jing Li, who's the awardee this afternoon for uh, in Innovation and Technology. Uh, professor Li works at the, is a professor at the uh, Rutgers State University of New Jersey in, in the chemistry department, and she has uh, had an outstanding and awesome career in material science, all dedicated to solving key problems that we face in the energy industry. This first uh, area of technology advancement has been the development of organic and organic hybrid uh, um, synthesis materials that could be, become the latest improvement to LED lighting. Uh, no rare earth materials and unprecedented uh, quantum efficiencies. The second area has been in uh, affordable uh, porous membranes that could possibly be used to separate CO2 uh, from the emissions of coal and natural gas power plants. You know, big problems that her, her uh, science is dedicated to helping to solve. And then the third area is in green chemistry, where she has developed a type of solvent that could be used in chemical processes. Now, if, in case you think that that in and of itself couldn't possibly uh, be an entire career, she has, in fact, uh, also at the same time been a mentor for many graduate students and undergraduates. I wanted to get the numbers right. She has been a research supervisor for 36 graduate students and 65 undergraduates. She has mentored high school teachers. Uh, she has hosted 15 visiting scientists and scholars, and approximately half of them have been women. There are many other ways that she has uh, contributed to the careers of the women that she, she surrounds herself with, uh, too many that I can mention. So I just want to say that in sum, um, Professor Lee has had a laser uh, sharp focus on developing material solutions to key clean energy problems. Um, I can't wait to see what this mid-career female scientist accomplishes as she moves into the next phase of her career. Uh, you may know this quote from Theodore Roosevelt, uh, which, he, which came from a Labor Day speech in the year 1903. He said, far and away the best prize that life offers is a chance to work hard at work worth doing. And Professor Lee has won that prize, and for that reason, I'm very pleased to also award her the Technology and Innovations C3E Award.
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Brown, for your really nice introduction. Uh, she has uh, so much, I thought, okay, you've done all for me. <laughs> anyway, um, it's, uh, I have to say that this is really a, a most um, inspirational event for me um, over my entire uh, career life. It's uh, wonderful. I mean, I, I'm so glad to have this opportunity to come here. Um, <clears throat> So I, I am uh, um, extremely honored to, to be here and uh, to um, accept this, this first ever C3 award um, in, the, in the category of uh, technology and innovation. Um, I, I am very grateful to uh, Professor Rick Riemann for his nomination and, for, um, and to, to our, uh, the US C3E program, uh, DOE and the MIT Energy Initiative for um, you know, uh, for their commitment to, to recognize, uh, recognizing the, the achievement of um, professional women uh, in the field of uh, clear, uh, clear energy. Uh, to all my uh, current and, and the past um, group members and, uh, and my collaborators for, for their commitment, um, their very hard work and uh, contributions. Um, I also, I am, you know, um, very deeply thankful to my family, my caring husband and my two wonderful children, uh, really for, for their, um, you know, unconditional love and uh, support, especially understanding over all these years uh, that I've spent uh, so many weekends at work. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, so in the past 12 uh, years or so, I, um, I have devoted my passion and time effort primarily to clean energy research and the development. Um, <clears throat> so together with my research team, we have, um, um, we have um, discovered this uh, unprecedented you know, um, hybrid nanostructured semiconductor material class um, that really show fascinating properties um, and also great promise for applications in a number of um, um, uses for energy, re energy conversion and the storage. Um, one group of these materials are zinc sulfur based hybrid white light phosphors that um, um, are completely free of, um, of uh, rare earth elements. Um, so these materials are especially, um, especially I think attractive today because of the, the serious supply shortage um, for, the, for the rare earth elements. So we, we really hope that uh, someday um, our, the, the LEDs that are um, um, you know, made of our phosphor materials will be on the market and uh, illuminating in your offices and, and, uh, and homes. Um, so another area you know, we are uh, also working on is developing this uh, very remarkable family of materials that are highly porous and uh, um, and uh, multifunctional, so they have a real potential to be used to capture harmful gases and the, and the greenhouse gases, um, such as carbon dioxide emitted from power plant as a waste. Um, so, and we also um, are working on using these materials to convert the harm, harmful gases, not only capture them, but, uh, but uh, convert them into fuel or other useful materials. So uh, by doing so, we, you know, we hope we can help to, to make the, um, uh, create the environment uh, cleaner and, uh, um, and the greener and to protect the future of our Earth. Um, as a woman, I, I am very fortunate to, uh, and also very proud to have the um, opportunity to actually work on the frontiers of chemical and uh, material sciences. Um, and especially on the topics that are, di that are directly related to clean energy um, and the renewable energy. Um, as a female faculty member, I, I have also had a um, privilege to um, serve as a mentor to uh, many motivated and uh, intellectually um, curious female students. Um, and um, uh, through a number of activities, um, including research projects, um, and other educational and training um, outreach uh, programs. So I hope that I have um, um, contributed to their interest in science um, with my own enthusiasm for clean energy research. Um, 
So this award is really um, not only a tremendous honor for me personally, but, the, but also um, a true inspiration for all of them. And uh, um, you know, I want them to know that uh, they too can succeed and thrive in this field. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to, um, to um, you know, about the C3E program and to participate um, uh, to, to the um, um, encourage and um, motivate the, uh, the uh, involvement, participation, and uh, also the leadership of women in all aspects of um, clean energy development. Um, so I am original from China. There, there um, is a very famous saying that I learned at a very young age. Um, that I have believed in and uh, carried with me throughout my life. Um, that actually was also mentioned by uh, Minister Peters this morning. Uh, women hold up half the sky. Um, so when we are united and work together, I, I think that uh, we really have the power and the strength to, uh, to make our world and the planet, planet um, a cleaner and better and uh, more beautiful place. And thank you so much. Thank you, Marilyn, and uh, congratulations to Professor Lee. Um, our next presenter is Maribel Ayers, another C3 ambassador. She is president of Lighthouse Consulting Group. Um, I've known Maribel for many years. I've known a lot of women here for many years. Uh, she has been a leader in the Washington business and political communities for three decades. Ms. Ayers serves on the board of directors of CMS Energy and the United States Energy Association. And Maribel will present the award for excellence in corporate implementation of clean energy programs. Maribel, there you go. Thank you, Melanie. Um, it's really an honor to be part of this uh, re remarkable event, um, and a real honor to introduce uh, the uh, award winner in this category, Liz Porter, uh, with Lockheed Martin. And um, I, I always think it's interesting to learn something of the stories behind people who have achieved what Liz and so many of the award winners and all of you have achieved. And I'm reminded how for many years now, I think all kinds of inspirational leaders have, have talked about following your bliss as you make your mind up about your career path. And indeed, Liz is an excellent um, example of that because uh, when she graduated from high school, she was devoted to her rock band as the lead singer and had absolutely no interest in going to college. <laughs> Um, so uh, it's, it's an important lesson on sometimes it may take a little bit longer to get on the path, but, uh, um, but uh, she did learn how to find her voice, and that was an important part of her, of her journey. And with some admonitions from her uh, very uh, uh, powerful, I guess, powerful presence of her mother, uh, Liz decided, well, okay, I will go to college as long as it can be somewhere in the Philadelphia area close to my rock band. So um, Liz went to Villanova, found the engineering program, because the other um, wise bit of advice here is to really understand your gifts. And she knew she was very gifted in math and science. And indeed, um, when she got to Villanova and took, I guess, a freshman course in photovoltaics, her, her, her career path um, uh, was easily chosen. Um, Liz has uh, an outstanding um, uh, career already, even at mid-career, and is with Lockheed uh, Martin, which we think of as a, it's a global aerospace company. And um, it's another, another cliche I'll bring out is that you can't really judge um, a book by its cover because one would not necessarily think of Lockheed Martin as... Um, such an extraordinary le leader in um, 
its green goals program and in renewables technology in general. And Liz has been um, intricately involved in leading those programs, particularly some of the the uh, sol solar powered um, satellite work. I learned last night at the Legal Seafoods Dinner about um, how GPS is something that um, is uh, one of the offshoots of, of the Lockheed Martin's work in that area. Um, another important aspect, I think, of what Liz does, because you'll hear from her about all of the um, mentoring work that she does, is recognizing that the power of technology needs to be matched by the power of communications. And in that role, she has really effectively driven any number of partnerships in the company between the business world, the government world, um, the academic world, and I'm sure many other worlds as well. Um, so let's bring um, Liz up to talk about that and, uh, um, and honor her accomplishments and hear more about them. Thank you. Thank you, Maribel. Uh, thank you, C3E. Thank you, MIT. And thank the Thank you, Ernie. <laughs> uh, I, I'm very honored and privileged to receive this award. Uh, there are many, many outstanding women in this room, as was evidenced by the panels we had earlier and then in the discussions between the networking last night, at the breaks here, and just hearing the variety of things that people are doing. Um, I'm very, very fortunate, and I would be remiss if I didn't slightly correct what Maribel said. Uh, I wasn't the one who picked electrical engineering. Similar to the fact that I was not going to go to college, I had no idea what I wanted to do in college, and it was my mother, the English and history major, who could not even understand how I did the mathematics that I did, that could see that I really enjoyed physics, and I really enjoyed math, and looked through a catalog and said, you know, there's this thing called electrical engineering that sounds like something you would do. And when I looked at their catalog, they actually had a course in sound engineering. So I figured when the rock band didn't work out, I could actually do the audio side. And I agreed to it. But I did find my path in uh, the Villanova University Engineering School. Uh, I did end up as an electrical engineer. And I have been very blessed with the opportunities that I've had throughout my career. I have worked for a version of Lockheed Martin. I started out in GE Astro, where I did design solar panels and um, solar arrays for a variety of satellites, including GPS. I always appreciate when they show those pictures of the, the way the world is uh, from a lighting perspective, because that's taken from the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program satellite, and that is one of the satellites I used to work on. Um, and electrical power subsystems was the other portion. And when you think about the way renewable energy technology works, it is an electrical power subsystem. The way a solar panel has to gather the, uh, pe generate power from the sun, and then figure out how to manage that and use that within the uh, storage capabilities that you have in a satellite so that you can have many, not just hours, but years of capability. The GPS satellites last for 15 to 20 years. So it's really great that a company like Lockheed Martin had the inspiration, and it was actually attributed to our senior vice president and chief technology officer, Ray Johnson, who I must also thank. He is the person who nominated me for this and who has had the passion and interest in pursuing what we could do to help solve energy challenges, and specifically uh, taking aerospace and defense technologies and applying them in that area. So I really, really appreciate you all recognizing me for this. Um, it has been a great opportunity to not only mentor women and other employees within my company, but to go to STEM events. I've spoken at many, many universities, and this is such a great topic to have young men and women rally around the concept of how we can solve the energy challenges, and knowing that it is engineers and scientists and mathematicians that actually solve those problems, and this will just help to continue with that effort. Um, the recognition has already um, allowed other individuals to reach out to me, so I very, very much appreciate it, and I appreciate the, uh, the time today, and I really appreciate some of the presentations that I've seen, so thank you very much.
Thank you, Maribel. Uh, congratulations to Liz. And now I know that if I had been in a rock band, I would have pursued a technical education. Um, <laughs> The, uh, but for the rock band. Um, uh, the next uh, presenter is uh, Dimpna Vanderlands, a C3 ambassador. She's somebody that I have only known for a short period of time, um, uh, not a long period of time. She is the senior director of the Economic Policy Program and Climate and Energy Program for the German Marshall Fund. Her experience includes work on distributed energy, energy efficiency, renewable energy, natural resources, investments, financial services, and work in China, India, the United States, and the European Union. Dimpton will present the award for excellence in advancing clean energy options in the developing world. Ms. Dimpton. I think I need to move this up. <laughs> the height gives away the fact that I'm Dutch. <laughs> um, I'm greatly honored um, to announce the recipient of the Award in Advancements of the for the Developing World, Dr. Laura Staschel. Um, Laura is the co-founder of We Care Solar, a nonprofit bringing solar lights and power to health facilities in developing countries as a means to improve maternal and infant survival. And as the minister said today, it is still unacceptable that women are dying while they're giving life. Um, Laura's inspiring story began when she traveled to northern Nigeria in 2008 to study ways to lower maternal morality in state hospitals. Um, she recognized that energy poverty impairs the ability of health workers to provide life-saving um, care. She studied hospitals with sporadic electricity and observed physicians conducting C-sections by flashlight, uh, midwives delivering babies by kerosene um, lanterns, and nurses unable to monitor and treat critically ill patients. She created We Care Solar to address this issue head on. Um, and she's using clean energy to do so. We Care Solar developed a solar suitcase and I think it's still sending outside for people who would like to take a look and I highly encourage you to do so. A portable low cost solar electric system that can be easily deployed to health clinics. Since co-founding um, We Care Solar, Laura has raised international awareness and action on the issue of clean energy for maternal health issues and healthcare. This year, We Care Solar initiated an international women's ambassadors program, giving 14 women around the world scholarships to take online PV courses, um, a week-long training workshop on, on solar suitcase installation, and international maternity he maternal healthcare. These women will join um, Laura as We Care Solar suitcase ambassadors and lead solar suitcase programs around the world. Not only is Laura breaking through, um, breaking down traditional boundaries between healthcare and energy, she's also promoting interdisciplinary projects and relations in order to advance the field, develop educational programs, and engage youth to build cap local capacity. Yesterday evening, I had the honor of sitting almost next to Laura for dinner. Um, her father was seated in between the two of us. Um, maybe I'm more honored to actually sit next to you, um, which is not true. Um, but what happened yesterday over dinner is something that's really quite remarkable and has always been something that I'm fascinated about. So we were giving this big binder to go through all these nominations and Laura really was just a sheet of paper to me. I read the sheet of paper and I thought, God, this is an amazing story. And still it wasn't Laura. But yesterday over dinner, I met her and I saw the whole woman. I saw the, the, the courage and the determination that it takes to do what it is that you truly feel you have to do. There's no other way, I think, for Laura than to step forward and do this. And I think for me as an ambassador, it was truly inspirational and just wonderful to see the whole woman and to see the whole person who fully engages with something that she so fundamentally believes in. Um, so with this, um, and with the fact that she's a true inspiration for me and for my young daughter already, I would like to ask Laura to come up and um, talk about the wonderful project that she's doing. going to be putting some slides that I was told not to bring, but I felt it was really important to really try and let you feel a little bit about the world that changed my life. Um, can we dim the lights just a little bit? 
So I want you to imagine right now that you're one of the 15 million women in the world this year who will be developing a complication during pregnancy. But imagine that you're not in one of the hospitals that we're so familiar, f familiar with. Imagine that you're in a hut in a village without electricity, sitting on a dirt floor by yourself in the dark. And after two days of trying to give birth, you realize something is wrong, even though you never had prenatal education. And you try and get your family to bring together the resources on their dollar a day income so that you can get transportation to get to a hospital. And they finally barter and get the money to get some fuel so that you can take the one vehicle from the village on an arduous journey to a hospital where you knock on the door and you're led in the room by a midwife who tries to understand whether your baby is still alive, why you're bleeding so heavily, and tries to figure out how she can contact the doctor who would need to perform the C-section to save your life. And this is the only light available. This is the grim reality for millions of women around the world. It's part of the reason why women like these in Sub-Saharan Africa face a one in 22 lifetime chance of dying during pregnancy. I'm an obstetrician. I never saw women die of these conditions in the United States. I thought when I went to Africa, I would be seeing women suffering from rare conditions. But in areas where access to healthcare and access to electricity are poor, these conditions, hemorrhage, infection, obstructed labor, which just means your baby's too big to fit, and in this country is followed by immediate C-section, and eclampsia, which is a blood pressure condition, are robbing women of their futures and families of mothers. In 2008, I was asked as part of a research project at UC Berkeley to go to a hospital in northern Nigeria to try and understand why Nigeria, with 2% of the world's population, was contributing to 11% of maternal deaths in the world. And I spent about 10 to 14 hours a day in this hospital just watching what was going on and trying to understand. It had never occurred to me before I went there that energy poverty was one of the major factors that was impairing the delivery of emergency care. So I literally watched while midwives tried to start intravenous lines with only a candle in the room or tried to deliver babies by a kerosene lantern that was never designed for obstetric care or I'd watch in operating theaters where the only light available was the ambient light from windows when the power was down. And this was a state hospital conducting 150 deliveries a month, attached to the electricity grid and with a diesel fuel generator. And even with those situations in place, the hospital was still without electricity for hours every day and sometimes for days at a time. I have the good fortune of being married to a solar educator, Hal Aronson, and I wouldn't be standing here without his support and his ingenuity. Because when I was sending him letters from Africa, he said, Laura, when you come home, I think we can help. What if we get our friends and family to put together the resources to create solar electric systems for the parts of the hospital that you think are going to be most effective at saving women's lives? And he designed four standalone solar electric systems that we hoped we could put into the laboratory for a blood bank refrigerator, put in the operating room, put in the maternity ward, and put in the labor ward itself. And we were able to get funding through a competition that we won at UC Berkeley, and I was able to go back, and the maternity ward, and that picture that you first started with was from that hospital. That literally was a kerosene lantern on this desk in a ward that was filled with patients that you could never see because the light was so dim. So the ward went from looking like this to this, and the operating theater went from looking like this to this. And what was most remarkable is that the midwives and doctors actually liked the LED lights that we had as backup better than the fluorescent lights we had brought. So this entire room is being lit with 15 watts of power. And we put in a blood bank refrigerator, and over the next year, the maternal mortality in that hospital dropped by 70% and has stayed down. To be perfectly honest, I thought I would go back to doing my research on maternal mortality. But the clinics around the hospital came to me and said, why are you only helping the hospital? We're trying to deliver babies in the dark as well. And so my husband put together a prototype, a small solar electric sy system with all the things that you saw in the first diagram, but compressed to the size that I could fit into a kit I could pack into my suitcase. And that was the origin of the solar suitcase. And we had requests from more and more facilities. 
And now the solar suitcase looks a little more like this, and we do have one on display that I'd be happy to share with you. And it's now been used in projects in many countries. In fact, it's been introduced into 20 countries with pilot projects in about four with partners like World Health Organization and Ministries of Health and other agencies. And this is the type of light that it now provides. That's a picture from Uganda in August where I was there bringing solar suitcases in an operating theater. But the technology itself, as people have said already today, is not enough. There needs to be education and training programs, so we go into the health facilities and we train health workers how to work within an energy budget. We provide training so people know how to do installations. And because we're working primarily in maternal health facilities, we want to teach women to also be the ones that are providing the technology and becoming trainers themselves. And that Women Ambassador program that you heard about is going to be starting this Sunday. So that we'll be training women both to be volunteers from the US and women from other countries to actually lead these training programs worldwide. And we also need communities to be supportive. And many of the communities in which we're bringing these systems have no electricity whatsoever. For example, this is an island in the DR Congo. This was the very first electricity brought. And the night that the doctor in the orange t-shirt, Dr. Jacques Sebasaho, brought this to his clinic, it was the onset of a cholera outbreak. And for 30 days, he actually struggled to keep everyone who suffered from cholera alive. And for the first time ever, 122 patients survived of cholera. And he credited the fact that he had light to be able to work through the night as being the instrumental difference in his success. Finally, I just want to say that getting the C3E award is an incredible honor. I have to give thanks to three special people in the room. Christina Johnson, who I met two years ago just when this program was being conceived. Thank you, Christina. This was a brilliant program. Richenda Van Leeuwen, who has been a special mentor to me. You saw her as a moderator earlier. She's been instrumental through the UN Foundation in establishing practitioner networks so that people like me can have a voice and speak with others who are working in renewable energy to try and help humanitarian um, problems to be solved. And of course, my father, who's sitting at the front, who is the whole reason I'm here to begin with. <laughs> Um, but I want to say that where I would like to take this award is to make others realize that the partnerships to make this program successful include the engineers and designers who can help us to make more efficient project, uh, products to work with this. We have engineers at Villanova University and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and welcome others of you interested in energy efficiency to think about how you can make medical devices more efficient and work off of 12 volt DC systems for heightened efficiency with our systems. We also need researchers to look at the impact of these systems. We need partners such as ministries of health, aid agencies like World Health Organization, UF, UNFPA, and others, and then groups just to advocate for women to be front and center um, in the world when we think about who should be benefiting from clean energy um, worldwide. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Dimpna, and congratulations to Laura. Um, next is uh, Karen Conover, um, our uh, C3 ambassador. Uh, Karen is the vice president of DNV KEMA, Energy and Sustainability. Um, she might tell me if I'm uh, that's an acronym or if it's a word. Uh, her experience is primarily in technical consulting in the wind energy industry. She founded Global Energy Concepts, a wind-focused company, and she serves on the boards of AWEA and, and the Women of Wind Energy. And Karen will present the award for clean energy entrepreneurship. Karen? It's a DNV Kima. <laughs> It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to see everyone in the room, and it's just really been inspirational all day to hear the stories. Today, I'm going to introduce Judy Dorsey, who is our awardee in the area of entrepreneurship. Judy Dorsey is the founding president and the principal engineer at the Brindle Group. This is a woman-owned engineering company in Colorado. Her career includes hundreds, I mean hundreds. I looked at some of them in, in specific, I wish I should, I should have brought some to talk about specifically because there were just dozens that were very interesting projects, sustainability projects across the nation in areas like clean energy, climate action planning, water and energy conservation, and sustainable design. 
She was also instrumental in the creation of the Colorado Clean Energy Cluster in 2006, and she served as its executive director until last year. And during this time, she was a key thought leader in creating the Fort Collins Net Zero Energy District, one of the world's largest. Also, together with women from Denmark, France, and Italy, she co-created the International Clean Tech Network, a global network of clean tech clusters. Her nomination was fantastic to read. Uh, she was nominated by the current CEO of the Colorado Clean Energy Cluster and the former director of the Colorado Energy Office. And it was just jam-packed with praise for her innovative ideas, her technical expertise, and real dedication to quality. If that's not enough, her family resides in the first LEED certified home in Colorado, and her company office is, is a, a LEED gold showplace of sustainable design. It's really cool. I hope we all get to go have a, a, a meeting or a visit there sometime. I'm very honored to give this award to Judy Dorsey. Thank you, Karen, for that kind introduction. I also wanted to thank the C3E program, including MIT's Energy Initiative and also the Department of Energy, as we understand the, the roots of some of the leadership behind this. I am likewise very honored to be here today um, accepting this award. I'm humbled and I'm having a lot of fun. It's really fun to be among such um, great women that we can talk shop right away without having to explain things. Um, <laughs> I also wanted to say it's fun for me because when we mentioned the inverse ratio, I'm traveling with my husband, and so he knows what I talk about when I come home and talk about the inverse ratio. Now he gets to experience it himself. So I, I wanted to acknowledge and thank my husband, Dan Epstein, and without him, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, I thought I would share my story um, through the lens of the one common factor that each of my entrepreneurial enterprises have had in common so far. In my case, I've launched three enterprises during my career. In each case, I found myself in a situation that was seemingly impossible but vitally important to solve, like a profound riddle, those brain teasers that we're always working on. The riddles always went something like this. Two opposing forces are instructed to fight each other till their death. Not only do they both come out alive, they end up creating a new tool to save the world. How did they do, do it? That's our riddle. While this riddle pattern was the um, common catalyst across each venture, uh, the common strategy to solve the riddle was always to seek lots of help and give thanks along the way. For example, my first experience with entrepreneurship came in 1996 when our son was born and I started the Brenner Group, a for-profit S-Corp. The riddle went like this. The world is telling you that you can't be a great mom and a great engineer. One of these visions must die. How can you have them both survive and thrive while creating a tool for saving the world? <laughs> the answer for me became social entrepreneurship. I started an engineering consulting company focused on sustainability. For inspiration, I um, named Brenner Group after my mother's maiden name. When my mother was likewise faced with the riddle of the working mom, it was a much earlier time, 1956, when her first child was born. Remarkably, she became a pioneering architect practicing passive solar design, and she became a great mother of eight children, six brothers. <laughs> That might explain clean energy for me, too. Um, like me, she had aspirations to start her own firm one day, but her life was cut tragically short from breast cancer. When she was 40 and I was four, between her inspiration and the social entrepreneurship framework, to tackle a working mom's riddle, the lasting 16 years at Brenda Group have been a dream come true. As for the strategy to seek lots of help along the way, I'd like to give thanks today and share this award with my talented team at Brenda Group. We are an equal employment, um, an equal opportunity employer. We do hire male engineers. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I would like to thank our esteemed group of advisors through the years and the more than 100 customers that have placed their confidences in us. My second entrepreneurial venture came 10 years later in 2006 when I helped to co-found the Colorado Clean Energy Cluster, a 501c3 nonprofit, one year, uh, by the way, after the MIT Energy Initiative. So thank you for the leadership there. It was a um, truly helpful um, resource and benchmark for us. This time, the riddle went like this. The world is telling you that you can't grow the economy without trashing the planet. Um, one of these visions must die. How can you have them both survive and thrive while creating a new tool for saving the world? The answer for us became our cluster-based approach to economic development focused on clean energy. Our strategy was to prove the concept through high-impact projects like Fort Zed, an initiative to convert a 50-megawatt footprint in downtown Fort Collins, including the main campus of Colorado State University, into a net-zero energy district that generates as much energy as it uses each year through distributed um, and renewable energies and smart grid technologies. In the strategy of seeking help and giving thanks along the way, are there, too, there are just way too many contributors to um, list, but I would like to give a shout out of thanks to the incredible network of clean energy, energy professionals in my home state of Colorado, especially to my fellow directors of the Colorado Clean Energy Cluster. Fort Zed has drawn attention from 63 countries. A dozen of those countries have brought delegations to Fort Collins, Colorado. We used to be the flyover state in some of these issues um, to visit Fort Zed, and thus I found myself faced with riddle number three. In 2009, the world is telling you that you must either be a competitor and win or a collaborator and compromise. <laughs> One of these visions must die. Riddle, how can you have them both survive and thrive while creating a new tool for saving the world? In our case, the uh, answer became the International Clean Tech, Tech Network. Clean Tech Network. Today, I give thanks to my fellow clean tech cluster managers in Denmark, Italy, France, Spain, Germany, Austria, North Carolina, and Singapore, the majority of which are women managing those clusters, for working with the Colorado Clean energy cluster to prove um, to, that regions can be globally competitive through a platform of collaboration. Platform, collaboration really is the new competition. Earlier I said I've co-created or created three enterprises so far. I am not done yet with several new ideas in various stages of development, all based on some variation of the either or riddle where we all know the answer is and. It's in this spirit that I give thanks, seek help, and invite collaboration from all of you here today on our shared mission of empowering women in clean energy. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Karen, and congratulations to Judy. Um, those of you uh, sitting at my table here have heard me twice today go, oh no, oh my God. The first time was when I received an email from uh, President Hockfield telling me that she was stuck in traffic and she was our, uh, our uh, opening speaker. And the second time was when I received an email here about an hour and a half ago saying that Heather Zeichel was stuck on a runway in Washington, D.C. and will not be here. And so given the order of how things have been done today, I have the very odd uh, uh, situation where I am introducing myself. Um, the, <laughs> the, the, um, and I'm only gonna say one thing. I was the director of the Office of Policy at the Department of Energy. Energy policy is, is um, uh, uh, a, a huge interest in, and it's been my life for a long, long time. And so it must be fate that I am actually presenting the award uh, to the recipient for excellence in policy. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I think probably Heather is not appreciative of that. Um, uh, Maggie, um, Maggie Downey is the award recipient for uh, excellence in policy. Um, Maggie is the assistant county administrator for Barnstable. I don't know how to say that. I work here, but I actually live in Washington, D.C. Um, Barnstable County is Cape Cod, Massachusetts. It has around 200,000 residents. Um, and I'm going to read, since this is a uh, late uh, preparation uh, done uh, very shortly ago, uh, Maggie, D I'm reading from her nomination form, and those are always uh, give a lot of insight into uh, how wonderful the, uh, the award recipients are. Maggie Downey is well known and highly respected for her leadership skills as the administrator of the C uh, Cape Light Compact, an energy aggregator serving the Cape and Martha's Vineyard. 
Cape Light Compact customers have saved over almost uh, $21 million annually on their electric bills since the agency's inception. The Cape Light Compact was also awarded the administration of the region's energy efficiency programs, programs which have saved over 103,000 uh, megawatt hours of energy use, offsetting the equivalent of um, 8.4 million uh, gallons of gasoline in terms of CO2 emissions. But Maggie recognized a greater need, the need to stabilize energy costs while working towards CO2 reduction goals. Um, the Cape Light Compact was unable to function in the way that Maggie envisioned, so Maggie developed a visionary plan for a Cape and Vineyard electric cooperative. After years of diligence and dedication, the Cape and Vineyard electric cooperative came into being in 2008. Um, as Maggie made presentation after presentation, slowly Cape Cod and Mothers Vineyard towns recognized the value of her work. Today, there are 20 member towns and counties comprising the CVEC. Um, I'd like to give a, a warm welcome and congratulations to Maggie Downey, and she's going to thank you. Well, good afternoon. I'm no, I'm, I'm batting cleanup, so I will not take. We're behind schedule, so I'll try to keep my comments very brief. Um, I want to say thank you. Thank you for the inter the introduction. I am, as everyone has said, I am very honored to be here and to be recognized for my work as a public servant. I have to say, I'm very fortunate. I'm blessed. I'm, I am living my dream. I made a conscious choice years ago that I wanted to work in the public sector. I wanted to have the opportunity to to see what I was doing implemented in my own community. And I have been very fortunate in my career, which is getting into, is definitely over double digits now, of being able to influence environmental policy. I w I've worked at the federal level, the regional level, and the local level. And you know, local is where it's at. And the history, I just want to talk a little bit about the history of the Cape Light Compact and why I'm here, uh, I think, receiving this award from C3E, which is a, an impressive organization, just listening to the stories and the impact that all of us and, uh, as women have had, not only on Massachusetts, on the United States, but on the world. It's, it's, it's amazing. And as I was writing my notes, I'm saying, oh, I was going to say that, but I won't say that because somebody else said it. Because we've, we're we're an amazing group of people. We should give ourselves a great round of applause for all of the hard work. Um, and I know all of us, like me, I'm here because I have been very fortunate to be surrounded by friends, family, and coworkers who had great visions. And I was in the right place at the right time and from a policy perspective to enable to implement them. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Cape Light Compact. So I know somebody has flashcards because I could go on for days talking about the Cape Light Compact. But I, I wanna share with you a little bit of a story because we are, very, we are a local public entity doing things and implementing things that most public entities don't do. And we're cutting edge, and cutting edge has a lot of great things. It also has a lot of downsides. But we started years ago when a very wise county commissioner, who then went on to be our state senator, had a vision for regional government on, in, in the field of energy. And he created and started the Cape Light Compact with a very small grant. I have to give a shout out to the Department of Energy. They had an Urban Consortium Energy Task Force grant. And then, of course, to DOER, who gave us a very small grant for us to become a municipal aggregator. And we're, we have a three-legged stool, as my chairman always said. I have 23 bosses. I work with 23 member communities. So I have 21 towns and two counties that sit on a governing board and direct the policy and give me the direction to implement our energy efficiency program. We are the only municipal aggregator in Massachusetts implementing or a program administrator running the energy efficiency programs on the Cape and Vineyard instead of the utility. And it allows us to have some unique 
um, programs that none of the other PAs have a focus on. We're close to our community. I'm kind of in a world, I'm in a room today right now with an overwhelmingly impressive power and knowledge, and I'm on my way to Martha's Vineyard for an energy fair to hand out night lights and talk about people to sign up for an energy audit. And it's that diversity that is, is the Cape Light Compact. It's very grassroots. I run into these people in the grocery store, and they want to know, you know, where's my rebate check for my dehumidifier that I handed in? And <laughs> And at the same time, I'm at the DPU working on uh, an intervention on something that has a profound impact on the ratepayers on the Cape and Vineyard. We, as we said, I think you said it all, we formed the Cape and Vineyard Electric Cooperative to pursue renewable energy projects locally. It's a member municipal, it's a municipal member cooperative. So again, the towns on the Cape and the Vineyard got together and said, at the time, we can't own electric generation, and specifically, we want to own renewable electric generation. So what can we do? So my role, I, you know, I'm not the biggest brain in the room, but my role and my success has always been to move those people in the room who have great ideas and help to implement them. And I'm very, very happy to say that we are in the process, at various stages of permitting, of installing almost 50 megawatts of PV. So you'll have every landfill on Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard covered with a huge solar PV array project and when you so when you come to the Cape you'll see wind turbines now when you come right over the bridge and if you're there make sure you take a trip to a landfill um, and they'll be covered in photovoltaic because a dedicated group of individuals that I'm very fortunate to work for sat down at the local level and f identified a problem brainstormed how they could resolve it and then um, I was very fortunate to work with people to begin to implement them. So again, thank you very much for this award. I am very, very honored to accept it.